Hello, and welcome to a conversation about the new book, 100% Democracy, The Case for Universal Voting, co-authored by E.J. Dion and Miles Rapoport. My name is Elizabeth Maddo. I'm an associate research professor at the Eagleton Institute of Politics at Rutgers University and direct our Center for Youth Political Participation. Our center is happy to be one of the co-sponsors of today's event. The conversation also is being sponsored by the Center for Election Reform, a nonpartisan nonprofit entity with the purpose of encouraging and supporting the right to vote. As we've seen, evidence is mounting that democracy is in trouble in the United States and globally. We're living in an era in which populist values are on the rise, authoritarian governance has been legitimized, and core demo democratic tenets have been undermined. Indeed, survey research even shows that young adults, not just in the United States, but globally, are starting to question the ability of democracies to solve our most pressing problems, such as climate change and social inequality. Now, although voter turnout rates in the United States in 2020 were historically high, the U.S. has always lagged behind comparable democracies when it comes to voting. And that's in due in large part to the way we hold elections in the United States. Now more than ever, American democracy needs an engaged and an equitable electorate to make sure that the consent of the governed promised by the framers is a reality. What's needed are bold democratic ideas. In their text, E.J. Dion and Miles Rapoport offer such a game changer a proposal for universal, universal voting and a package of what they're calling gateway reforms that will make universal voting a reality. They're gonna be speaking to us today about how recent events motivated this book, what models of universal voting around the globe look like and how universal voting might take hold here in the United States. The authors bring rich scholarly and practical experience to this topic. E.J. Dion is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute and a syndicated columnist for the Washington Post. He's a university professor at Georgetown University and a visiting professor at Harvard University. Dion has numerous publications um, on the subject of American politics. Uh, we're grateful he's been a guest of the Eagleton Institute before, last time in person, hopefully next time in person. Um, but we're thrilled to have him here again today. Miles Rapoport is the Senior Practice Fellow in American Democracy at the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation at the Harvard Kennedy School. He formerly served in the, in the Connecticut State Legislature and as Connecticut Secretary of State and has served as President of Common Cause and Demos. Moderating much of our discussion today will be the Honorable Travis L. Francis. Judge Francis is an Eagleton visiting associate a former Superior Court Judge of New Jersey and President of the Center for Election Reform. He's also served for numerous years and is an adjunct Rutgers Law School professor, teaching civil liberties and personal litigation skills. Uh, a few quick notes about today's format. Judge Francis will moderate much of today's discussion. I'll return towards the end um, to offer some questions that have been submitted by those enjoying the conversation or those that were submitted when folks registered. Um, if you'd like to submit a question, please do so. Feel free to do so via the Q&A button on Zoom. We'll also throughout be sharing links for purchasing 100% Democracy, the case for universal voting. Um, but thank you all for joining us. Enjoy the conversation. And I'm happy to hand things off now to Judge Travis Francis. And thank you, Professor Mato. So um, I want to welcome all of the participants and I am particularly honored uh, and pleased to be moderating this discussion with um, E.J. Dion and Miles Rappaport. So let me start with um, a question that I'm certain you have been presented with um, more times than you want to recollect, uh, but what motivated the writing of this book? Well, first of all, let me just uh, thank Professor Maddow and you, Judge Francis, for doing this. Uh, thanks to the Eagleton Institute, which is really one of the great places that studies politics in our country. Uh, you're known everywhere, and it's a real honor uh, to be here. Uh, thanks also to all the people who helped put this together and those of you on the call. And last, I just have to thank my co-author. Uh, 
I always say about Miles that he has so much energy that if Europe could tap him, they'd never have to import another drop of Russian oil. And it's just been a real <laughs> joy uh, to work with Miles all the way uh, through this. Um, I have uh, personal reasons for getting interested in this idea that includes spending quite a lot of time in Australia over the years and seeing how their political system worked. And as I'll get to in a second, real concern about efforts to block access to the ballot that have been going on. And this seemed like the idea that if we adopted it in full with the necessary reforms, uh, could finally settle our um, disputes over voting by saying that it's in the interest of our democracy to have as close to everyone participate as is possible. Um, I like to invite people to think about our current election system as being like one of those fancy dinner parties where there's an A-list and a B-list and a C-list. Under our current system, there is an A-list of likely voters, the people who vote a lot. They get all of the attention or nearly all of the attention from the political consultants and the candidates. Um, and then there's a B list of people who are registered but may not participate that much, and they get very little attention. And then there's a C list of citizens who are not registered at all, and they get absolutely no attention. Miles and I believe that this has some really very bad effects on our politics. Effect one, um, candidates spend um, a lot of their time simply trying to turn out their base without necessarily fe feeling an obligation to reach out to those uh, who might not be drawn to political participation. They also spend a lot of time trying to suppress the other side's base and depress the other side's base. You saw a lot of that go on in 2016 with all the nasty stuff that went on online. It wasn't aimed at persuading people to vote for the other person. Um, and this is particularly, I think, the Trump campaign with Hillary Clinton. Uh, but it happens across the board. It was just to say, well, I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican, but my person is lousy. I'm not going to vote at all. Um, neither of those things, the enraged to engage on the base side, as Miles likes to put it, or the suppression on the other side's base is good for our democracy. And people do things when they're invited to do it. And if you don't ask someone to do something, they're less likely to do it. And no one is asking people on the B and C lists uh, to uh, participate. Uh, there's a great Tip O'Neill story. It might be apocryphal. Uh, but I, I, it sounds right to me that a friend ran into the late Speaker of the House after an election, said, congratulations, Tip, on your victory. And O'Neill said, well, I assume you voted for me. And she said, oh, no. And um, Tip O'Neill said, why? You've known me forever. And she said, well, you never asked me. Uh, and there are a whole lot of voters we yeah. never asked to participate. The second reason, which we'll get into more, and I know Miles will pick up on, um, is that if that we believe the best way to defend the right to vote is to declare a universal civic duty obligation to vote, a legal obligation to vote. Um, because if you declare that obligation, you have to make it easier for people to register and to vote. And that's what they've done in Australia. Uh, we'll be talking a lot about the two dozen countries that have systems along these lines we largely model our proposal uh, with a few tweaks after the one that exists in Australia. In Australia, 96% of citizens are registered and 90% of them vote. We think that's an ad, something that we should aspire to. Um, if Australia can make their system work for their electorate, why can't the United States do the same? Yeah, and you know, I, um, we're gonna drill down into that. <clears throat> to some degree, but since you mentioned Australia um, and the other 26 countries that require uh, participation in elections, are there any identifiable cultural similarities between those countries? Uh, do you wanna pick it up, Miles? Just, uh, uh, I'm, ha I'm happy to answer it as a follow-up, but Miles, why don't you come in and I'll, I'll come back. No, you go ahead, I'll, I'll come back around. 
Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> there are, the, the interesting thing about the list is that it's a quite varied list, um, which is one way to put that is this. And, and we on our list, we only put democratic countries, small d democratic countries. Right. Um, it is very popular in Latin America. The system has been uh, particularly effective, I would say, in Uruguay, which has a very stable and effective uh, democracy. Um, it's been used in uh, a number of European nations. Belgium, Italy has had it off and on, uh, and other uh, European nations. I think Luxembourg is on our list, if I remember right. Um, it's used some in Asia. Uh, some Indian states have it. So on the one side, um, there are um, a, a whole range of countries that use it. Um, one of the reasons we use Australia is because I think a lot of Americans identify with Australia, know about Australia. Um, it is an immigrant society that had to struggle with certain forms of uh, discrimination, particularly with its, uh, um, you know, it, its Aboriginal, what used to be known as the Aboriginal community. Um, and so we think that um, we use Australia, A, because it's existed there for 100 years. So it's very rare that somebody proposes a reform that has a proof of concept that goes back a whole century. Um, and um, secondly, just because I think Americans feel they're familiar with Australia. Um, and thirdly, because I love the fact that Australians have turned Election Day into a party. Uh, we will probably be talking somewhere along the line of democracy lines of democracy sausages, um, where one of the great things in Australia is that voting is such a broadly shared activity. Um, and while you can vote early and have all kinds of other options, election day is on a Saturday, uh, which most people have off. We think election day should be a holiday. Everybody shows up. So school groups and community groups are all raising money, selling wonderful things to eat. Uh, and so uh, I just say two things about that. One is uh, democracy sausages are the most popular thing. And in our book, we explicitly recommend them, but also vegan alternatives. Uh, and the second thing I'll say is, uh, I think the most significant critique of our system is that it would make Election Day a holiday, and therefore people would risk gaining a little bit of weight on Election Day, but we think that's worth it for democracy. <laughs> so, again, referring to Australia, did the... Did the um, uh, native Australian or Aboriginal um, uh, Australian population increase their voting percentages as a result of this, um, uh, uh, the, in, the insertion of uh, universal voting? Well, very quickly, it, it, it sure. was seen as a form of discrimination because they weren't included under the obligation until very late. I if my recollection, Miles, is not until the 80s were they included? And it was getting them included into the system of being obligated to vote was a way to knock down barriers. And I'll kick it over to Miles because I know he likes to talk about this. It's the mm -hmm. same with jury duty. One of the greatest reforms in our history was to knock down racial barriers in uh, discrimination against Black Americans and serving on juries. But that meant requiring putting uh, black Americans under the same requirement as white Americans uh, to serve. And so that it, it took them a while to get around to putting this requirement um, on the native population. Now it's universal. And again, we would have it be universal in the U.S. Okay. Miles? Yeah, well, I, I was uh, taken um, so uh, let me take a step back and tell you how I sort of got into this, uh, which in which in which story EJ plays a part. I'll I'll say the short version. But, you know, as a, a state legislator in Connecticut, as a secretary of the state for four years there, uh, as president of Demos for 13 years in Common Cause, you know, I have been working on voting rights issues and democracy expansion issues for almost 40 years. Um, and I believe in the, all the reforms that people have worked on. I believe in the restoration of voting rights for people with felony convictions, the same day voter registration, early voting, expanded mail-in voting. These are all things that have moved the needle. But when I thought about it, you know, and, and, and I think they were part of the fact that in 2018, we had a record turnout, um, depending on how you count it, but a record turnout for midterms at 50.3%. And a record turnout in 2020 at about 
And on the one hand, I'm glad. And I think that part of the reason that that was true was people had more opportunities and more options to both get registered and voted. But when you look at it, 50.3% and 66.2% are not really anything to write home about. And so I started to say to myself, what is it that might really seriously move the needle? And then I read a a paper that E.J. Dion wrote with a colleague of his at the um, at the Brookings Institution, William Galston, which made the case that we ought to do it, do what Australia has done. And I said to myself two things, actually. I said, wow, this is really interesting. I could really imagine, um, you know, this moving the needle in a very serious way. And the second thing was, how is it that I've been working on these issues for 40 years? And this has been existing in Australia and 25 other countries. And I have never been in a conversation about it. And I pride myself on being, you know, up on these issues. So uh, that made me decide that we really, I really wanted to get into it. Uh, EJ and I created a working group that was a joint group of the Ash Center and the Brookings Institution. And that led to this book. So I'm delighted. And I will say also that EJ has been an incredible partner. You know, he's a brilliant writer and journalist and academic, also a really, really nice guy. Um, so this has been a labor of love. Thank you, Miles. Well, having read the book, I have to say it is a brilliant collaboration, and I would encourage any serious political scientist to read the book. Now, we know. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. We know that this is not designed. Uh, to be a panacea or to answer all questions regarding voter voter participation. So my question is, is part of the goal in writing the book to jumpstart the conversation about universal voting and well, as well as other concepts such as ranked choice voting? Yeah, I think we definitely see it that way. I mean, you know, for universal voting itself, I think our idea here is to put out a North Star for reform. And the reform is not, gee, let's have a fine the way they do in Australia. The reform is having every single person participate in a democracy or having us uh, having our democracy represent the consent, as EJ often says, of all the governed, not just some of the governed. And so, you know, we think that that, you know, this is we want to, you know, get it into the public debate. We recognize that this is a long and uphill uh, effort. Uh, but what we hope is that on the one hand, we can get, you know, journalists and scholars and students to be thinking about it in a in a in a significant way. We hope that organizations um, in the democracy movement, which I have been part of for 35 years, uh, will pick it up and uh, run with it, not in place of everything else they're doing, but as a, as a supplement to what they're doing. And then we are hopeful that some states or some municipalities uh, coming, you know, come next year and maybe a couple of years from now, will begin to put this in and debate it as legislation. So that's our, that's our goal for the next couple of years. Yeah, and that leads me to my next question. Is, is, is universal voting particularly suited for states and, and, and municipalities uh, more so than the national elections? We would, as we argue in the book, uh, it can work at all levels. And uh, we were very pleased that um, we did an appearance about this idea on Morning Joe a couple of weeks ago, I guess three weeks ago now. Mm -hmm. Um, And Congressman John Larson of Connecticut saw us, said, this is a great idea. And he introduced it into Congress. I think the bill went in about a week, a week and a half ago. And um, he's got one co-sponsor already. He's looking for others. So you could certainly do this at the federal level for federal elections. Our strategic sense is that, as with many reforms, um, it will start at the state level, Um, just as some states and localities have gone to uh, the single transferable vote, the instant runoff. Um, So we think some states could do it here. And that one of the appendices in the book is a bill that was introduced in the Connecticut legislature. I'm proud to say by one of my former students, State Senator Will Haskell put it in in Connecticut. There's a bill that's in in Massachusetts. We're hoping that these bills will proliferate Um, And that we'd like to see some jurisdictions try it. Um, One of the good things about promoting a book is people give you good ideas when you talk to them. And somebody had the great idea that we ought to try to find two smaller states, one very Republican and one very Democratic, uh, to experiment with it at the outset, say Vermont and Utah or something like that. 
uh, Utah is a, a pretty reform minded state, actually, on a lot of a lot of issues. The other thing I want to underscore is we do not pretend to be I don't want to be like those elixir salesmen in the 19th century. Here, we got a cure for everything that ails right. you. We right. are very specific in the book to say there are a lot of things that need to be fixed in our system. Miles and I are both uh, sympathetic uh, to instant runoffs. We both have questions about we both would like to get the, our country to abandon the Electoral College and uh, elect the president through popular vote. There are a lot of reforms we are for. But what we're trying to do here is make an argument for a very specific reform that we don't think will solve all problems, but could solve some very, very important problems at the heart of our democracy. And so that's the case we're making here. Now, do any of the countries that you referenced among the 26 have a political structure similar to our electoral college, one and, and two, uh, how do you see your, your, your case for universal voting uh, being impacted by or having an impact on the electoral college? Well, uh, very few countries in the way they run elections emulate the United States. I am uh, duty bound to say so. First of all, Almost all countries have a nonpartisan and national election administration. Oh, Australia has the electoral, the Australian Election Commission, which has sets up standards and kind of leads the implementation of this. Um, nobody has a, an electoral college the way we do, and uh, you know that is a distortion. Frankly, the 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 um, you know the structure of the United States Senate is uh, pretty undemocratic, where a big state like New Jersey, you know, has the same. Um, you know, representation as a tiny state uh, like Wyoming. So, you know, so, so we're unique in many, many ways. One of the ways we're unique, by the way, is that we have lots and lots of elections. We have municipal elections. We have school board elections. We have water board elections. We have, uh, all, you know, New Jersey has its elections on an off year from the, the rest of the country. So right. uh, I think our recommendation would be if we were thinking seriously about an implementation plan for this, to consolidate the number of elections, um, you know, we don't want to, I don't think we want to say, gee, we have to get rid of the electoral college before we can do universal voting. On the lane of getting voters to participate, I think universal voting kind of stands on its own. And I think one of the things that we'll do is make other um, uh, election reforms like same day voter registration, which I know is being, you know, seriously discussed in, uh, in New Jersey and um, other, other kinds of reforms. Uh, I think it makes them more seem more reasonable and more moderate. Uh, so in a way, we're kind of setting the poll out there to see how we, far we can get and maybe make some of the other things seem more reasonable. Just two yeah. quick points. One, no country has anything like the Electoral College, and that ought to teach us something. Uh, you know, this system was put in place over 200 years ago for reasons that we don't accept anymore. I mean, the, the, we were a less small D democratic country. We had set up a trajectory toward democracy, and we have to remember that. Uh, and no other country does this. This really struck me. I wrote about the French presidential election a couple of weeks ago, um, and they knew the results real quick, really quickly, because all they had to do was count the votes. You didn't have to worry uh, gee, will this um, uh, area in southern France provide a narrow majority in the Electoral College for someone? They just counted the votes. And so I do. I don't think this necessarily pushes us in that direction, but I sure wouldn't mind if it would. But just to take it the next step, though. So if putting aside the Electoral College, if, if it were purely a democratic process and the majority rule, uh, would that then not fly in the face of the equalizing purposes associated with the Electoral College? Well, we, I mean, we have a basic and fundamental faith, I think E.J. and I both, that a, 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 the fully reflective participation of all of the citizens will get us to better decisions than uh, decisions that are made by an electorate that, uh, you know, uh, well, you, Professor I.L. Brangenberg has worked on the issue of youth voting, uh, I know here at Rutgers, but, you know, the system is still makes it much harder for young people to vote. And so the, the concerns of young people are less represented than the concerns of older people. Um, 
you know, more wealthy people vote much more often than poorer people. And so the wealthy people are, in addition to being donors, uh, they're also, you know, regular voters. And so they get more impact. So our feeling is that, that if we can just get us to uh, everybody voting, even with the, with the electoral college st- still in place, but obviously much better if it were not, uh, I think that's a real step forward. So arguably, the system that you're recommending changes the incentive system. Um, would, would you agree with that? And, and if you do, can you talk about that within the context of today's incentive system? Um, yeah, yeah, very much so. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, AJ. Um, yeah, by the way, let me, I, I cheated and looked at some of the great questions in the Q&A. And I just want to say to Miriam Eichler, I hope I pronounced your name right, uh, to, to something I'd said earlier about Australia voting on Saturday. We don't, and she is concerned rightly about whose religious holiday is when. Uh, we think election day should be a holiday. There are probably reasons not to do it on either a Friday or Saturday or Sunday. And we also are for all kinds of accommodations for early voting so that people can come in without violating their uh, traditions. I sort of like the way the Italians used to do it, uh, which is Sunday and Monday morning for people who went away on the weekend. Uh, But that's just I just want to take her specific question because it's a fair. uh, I mentioned the Saturday voting in Australia. Hers was a, a fair question. Um, Yeah, we believe the incentives change uh, a great deal and they have to change because you cannot impose a requirement on everyone to vote uh, if people are going to make it hard for people to vote there. That's two parts of the law that are in conflict. And so our whole purpose here is to bring the law in line with the idea of everybody should vote. Everybody has a right to vote. And therefore, the job of election law and election officials are to make it as easy as possible uh, for people to vote. When we were researching the book, uh, my uh, former uh, 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 research assistant was looking up all the ways in which Australia made it easy for people to register and vote. And she came into my office, uh, Amber Hurley did, and said, this is fantastic. Why can't we do this? And of course, we can do this. Um, Australia essentially puts everyone on the rolls. You have a requirement to make sure you're registered and they get everybody registered. Um, If I could just talk briefly about the mechanics of this, uh, which is what Australia does is if you don't vote, uh, you get a little notice from the government that says you didn't vote. Um, If you give any sort of excuse that's reasonable, you don't have to pay a fine. Um, uh, If you don't, you have to pay a $20 Australian fine, which is about $15.00. Last I checked, the exchange rate today is volatile on the market, so maybe it's a little different. Um, And um, only 13 percent of people pay the fine. We worried a lot about what you might call the Ferguson problem, low income people having fines piled up on top of them. Uh, So we make very clear no penalties, no interest. Um, It's $20 flat. It cannot be criminalized. It's not a criminal fine. Um, And you can pay the fine if you don't get out of it, uh, which most people do with by simply responding to the government. Um, We also uh, provide for in good American fashion for conscientious objection, uh, where um, if you really want to stay out of the political system and some religious traditions, some people for principal reasons don't want to participate, we would allow that, too. We see this system not as a shove, not as a hammer but as a nudge, and a nudge seems to work well in Australia. Miles, I just wanted you to pick up because you have- Yeah, a- Judge Francis, let me, let, me, let me address specifically the question about changes in the incentive system. Because I think you. it's important. I want to mention two. One is I think there is a serious change in the incentive system for all of the institutions of our society. So uh, uh, as EJ knows, I, I, you know, I feel like if I were the principal at a high school, and I knew that every graduating senior was going to have to vote, would that make me more likely to make sure that civic education was a higher priority than it is in most schools now? I think it really would. And if I were an employer and I knew that all of my employees were actually legally required to vote, uh, would that make it more likely that we would give them the chance and the opportunity to do that? I think I think so. And I think you can see that in all of the kind of institutions, civil society, community organizations, organizations, 
uh, labor unions that would be uh, impacted. So that's number one. But number two, I really think it would change the incentive system for campaigns. As EJ said earlier, you know, right now the incentive system is turn out your vote. In fact, you know, you probably heard their Democratic campaign consultants who are, who are saying right now, 2022 is a turnout election. We don't need to persuade people. We just need to get a, if everybody voted who voted in 2018 will win. And I'm sure the other, those conversations are taking place uh, in Republican strategy circles as well. So, but, but so that the incentive is to turn out your vote. And as EJ also said, to depress your opponent's vote. Um, and, and, you know, some states are really taking it to the extreme by passing legislation, you know, that is really making it harder for people to vote and also making it harder for the uh, nonpartisan election administration to count the vote. So, um, you know, I think that's one thing. But if you had uh, everyone voting, and so if you had universal voting and every single person was going to vote, then every single person is listening all the time. And as a candidate or as a political party, you need to talk to everybody. You can't just talk to people who agree with you and make sure that they are scared enough to uh, go out and vote. And I think that would be a really healthy thing. I think it, campaigns would shift. Some money would be saved, you know, by all the all the money and work that goes into, you know, GOTV efforts. Um, but I also think that, uh, you know, people would it, it would it would tend at least to moderate the electorate because, Instead of just aiming at people who are ideologically committed and, you know, fire them up, you've got to talk to people who are not so committed. And I think that will make it more moderate. And there's some indication in other countries that that has actually been the case. Yeah, you know, um, there are some who would opine that Republicans might be, uh, might have some fear associated with the notion of universal voting. And I know that uh, the state of Virginia passed a, um, a piece of legislation that sort of opened up voting to make it more um, democratic, to make the franchise more democratic than it had been in the past. And um, and I think the I think the Republican uh, gubernatorial candidate um, was advantaged by that uh, particular con by your concept. At, in fact, so to speak on 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 the rational basis or um, assuming there is one, uh, 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 or, the, or the Republican fear. Well, Judge, you read our minds because Miles and I, a lot of people ask the question, how could Republicans ever support uh, something like this? And we always cite Virginia as one of the key examples where Virginia Democrats opened up the system. And in the last election under that very open system, because there was very high turnout of their voters, um, the Republicans swept all three statewide offices. So that's absolutely right. In the book, we talk about the 2020 election where um, the Democrats swept in 2018 for many different reasons. And there was obviously a backlash against President Trump. But a lot of his people didn't come out in 2018. And people ask themselves the question, how did the Republicans pick up seats in the House when Joe Biden was getting elected president with a 7 million popular popular vote margin. It's because in Republican parts of the country, the Trump constituency, um, uh, mostly um, you know, working class, uh, lower middle class white voters, um, came out in 2020 in a way they didn't in 2018. So we make very clear, this is not an effort to rig the electorate in, behave, in on behalf of our own candidates. Miles and I are both on the progressive side. We make no bones about that. Right. But that's not our purpose. Our purpose here is not to guarantee election outcomes. It's to create more small D democratic uh, election outcomes uh, that include everybody. And our own polling, by the way, um, I like to say this, our, our book proves that Miles and I are either the most honest book writers in the world or the dumbest. Because we did our own polling, and right now only about a quarter of Americans support our idea. Uh, on the other hand, a half of Americans are strongly opposed to it. We figure that gives us an opening right for the start uh, with about half of uh, the country, or at least open to the idea. And I thought that 26% was pretty good for an idea no one has ever advanced systematically uh, before. But what we found, and this was admittedly before uh, Donald Trump did what he did with par uh, the issue of participation and the fake election and all that mm -hmm. nonsense. 
Um, Republicans and Democrats were nearly equal in their openness to this idea. And they were entirely equal in answering another question, which is that uh, six in 10 Americans, including 69 percent of both the Republicans and Democrats, believe that voting is both a right and a duty. Um, so we believe there is some opening to reach uh, some uh, some and we hope over time many Republicans on this idea, although we we're, we're realists. We know that's not going to happen tomorrow morning. Right. You, you can learn quite a bit. And this is for the audience uh, from reading this book, folks. Uh, so I would encourage you to, to, to get it in, in whatever format you like. Miles, I know you wanted to. Add Judge, please come with us to all our other events. <laughs> uh, we would really be grateful. <laughs> Miles, I know you want to comment on that. Uh, but if I could just be, before you comment, ahead, just sure. insert that um, again, learn from the book. There's overwhelming support for absentee balloting, for absentee ballots and voting by mail. Like 71% of the people, um, according to the book, are in favor of that. So that's consistent with, with EJ's point. So, Miles, um, go right ahead. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's interesting. One of the things that happened in 2020, almost against all odds, mm -hmm. was a really, really robust turnout. And one of the things that happened is that, you know, uh, election officials all around the country, you know, may understood that there was a danger for people to vote in person. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they created, a, a, you know, different alternatives, uh, early voting, curbside voting, in some cases, voting overnight, uh, drop boxes, uh, you know, un much, much more access to mail-in voting, increased levels of early voting. So they made it possible for people to do it. And what, lo and behold, people took advantage of it and came out in, in droves. Now, that should be a cause for celebration, Unfortunately, we definitely do, do see that the, for some people, this was a lesson in what not to do, which is allow people to uh, to vote, you know, freely. And so we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of pushback on that. But I really think that uh, you know the 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 effort to suppress the vote and to subvert election administration is an effort by a relatively I don't want to say a small minority, but certainly a minority of people who are seeking to enshrine minority rule. And I think that, you know, if you look at the population as a whole, uh, I think mu there's much more support for everybody voting and everybody having a better chance to vote. And I think, you know, as we hopefully as we talk about universal voting as a, as a serious concept, you know, with a congressional bill and with state bills and, you know, that uh, people will start to see that, wow, this is a logical extension of things that I already support. Just could I underscore something Miles said sure. briefly that sure. uh, 2020 was a great victory for democracy and a great victory for the idea that, you know, if you make it easier for a little bit easier for people to vote, they're going to take advantage of it. And that was important since 2020. We are really becoming two Americas when it uh, uh, when it comes to democracy, according to the Brennan Center. Uh, 25 states have actually built on the reforms of 2020 to further expand access. 19 states have in one way or another rolled back access. Um, that doesn't make sense. I mean, they theoretically it can happen in a federal system, um, but that doesn't make sense. It's why Miles and I both support federal legislation, the Freedom to Vote Act and uh, the John Lewis Act, uh, you know, Voting Rights Advancement Act. Uh, we think there should be federal standards. But again, we think our idea is a way to say, you know, can we please agree, no matter where we live, uh, that we're all better off if all of us have access? Now, among the states that you just referenced that expanded um, the, the access based on, on the, um, some of the um, um, experiences that came out of 2020, were they both blue and red states or, or, or primarily blue states? There, yeah, it's interesting. Generally, it, it certainly does divide and blue states were more likely to be expansive in, in opening up their voting, but not exclusively. I mean, the, the state of Utah has, in fact, expanded voting in a number of ways. I was surprised to see that South Carolina, just like two weeks ago, was a, had a bipartisan um unanimous support for a bill that extended early voting, that added days to early voting. And in Kentucky, you know, where there's a pretty concerned, there's a Democratic governor and a conservative legislature, they worked in a bipartisan way to open up the system. So uh, I, I want to say also, as, as a kind of former secretary of the state, 
there are definitely Republican sectors of the state who worked really, really hard in 2020 to make it possible for people to vote. So this is not, uh, in my mind, you know, a kind of a partisan critique of, you know, all Republican uh, elected officials and election officials. You know, I think there is, as I said, there is a faction. I think, you know, we have to, to sort of say it as it is. The efforts to do this have to be fought. They have to be fought in court. They have to be fought in legislatures. They have to be fought in, in the streets, in a way, in demonstrations. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the other hand, I, know, I think both EJ and I feel like we don't, all, we don't want to stop thinking about tomorrow. So on the assumption that we can get through the challenges that we have right now, which are significant and which need to be pushed back, um, you know, we, ought to start, we ought to be also able to think about what it might really, really be like um, in a situation where everybody is participating. And thank, thankfully, we have some 25 countries around the world that actually have done this, for, uh, some for a very long time. Now, I, I know the book is, is, is relatively new, but did you do any polling on the idea? And if you did, um, what were some of the results that you received, particularly as it relates to um, age and, and you know, focusing on young people, um, who are the future, um, gender, and um, and you mentioned a couple politicians that that seem to embrace the idea. Um, was was it more? Were there more than a couple? <laughs> um, let me just do the polling, and then we can talk about the politicians. Sure. Um, here's there are a couple of interesting things about the polling. So. Um, again, 61 percent say voting is a, both a right and a duty. Uh, and there's an interesting contradiction between people's attitudes on that question and people's answers on the idea itself, which is young people are less likely than older people to say that voting is both a right and a duty. Um, you know, that, that and old, older people, people over 65, 69 percent say it's a right and a duty, only 49 percent of uh, 18 to 29 say it's a right and a duty. Uh, we think that reflects, and our friends at Netscape, that the, um, the polling project that kindly did this research for us, there's a certain alienation from the system among a certain number of young people uh, that leads to that answer. On the other hand, young people are more open to our reform uh, than uh, older people. That um, among the 18 to 29 year olds, you get 31%. Among the 65 pluses, you only get 18 percent. Um, so we think that there's an opening to older people on the underlying idea that it's a civic duty. And there's an, uh, clearly younger people are, are more eager to try out a new reform uh, than others. In terms of objections to our idea, there is sort of a pure libertarian. We ask people why they were for or against it. And you know, there were several streams. There was a kind of straight up libertarian, the government can't tell you to do this argument. And our reply to that is to say two things. One, it's a reason we want to nudge and not a shove here. Um, and we try to make the uh, process as undraconian as possible. But we also make the point that people are required to do certain things by government. They're required to send their kids to school for 16 years, or if they homeschool to meet certain standards, they're required to serve on juries. So that we think this is, you know, this requirement, if you're on a long uh, trial, that's a much more onerous burden on someone than what we're asking uh, here. The other objections were practical, and we met a lot of those in the book. And as you know, Judge, from your kind, uh, close reading of the book, um, you know, we take their critiques and say, here's our answer uh, to this. So we have the gateway reforms because people say you can't impose this on a system that restricts access uh, to the ballot, for example. So that's where we are on the polling. So polling shows, A, we have work to do, and B, there are some openings to make this argument. Okay, we, we've only got uh, about five minutes left, and I just want to... Um pose one question that I hope doesn't take a long time. And then the second question that relates to your legal chapter, which I found to be fascinating, uh, well-written and written in a fashion that you don't have to be a judge or a lawyer to understand. But we did write it for you, Judge Francis. 
<laughs> we had you Thank in you mind. Very, Thank you writing. very much, Miles. I appreciate it. Uh, but the first question being, so what technological changes would the system require um, to, to protect the integrity of the process? Well, the, you know, it's interesting. The, um, it doesn't necessarily need huge uh, changes, right? In other words, we now have a registration system that is expanding. So when you have automatic voter registration, so when people go to the motor vehicles or to other state agencies and they have the opportunity to register, uh, frankly, you know, they, they are automatically registered unless they individually opt out in most places. Uh, you know, we're making some real progress. There is a lot of uh, good work being done on how to keep the voting rolls clean. I mean, you know, the, the, the word purging of voter rolls, um, you know, with some real justification has a, has a bad name because um, purging of the voter rolls can be done with a view towards throwing people off who ought to be able to vote if you don't want them to vote. Right. But on the other hand, you know, there's a system called ERIC, the Electronic Registration Information Center, mm -hmm. where different states, you know, trade information. So if people have died or they have moved from one state to another, uh, with safeguards, the roles are getting more clean. So I think we need clean uh, administration. The other thing I think we really need is funding. You know, uh, um, uh, in addition to being kind of uh, balkanized and, and uh, you know, kind of uh, lots and lots of different ways of, of doing it, uh, elections are, election administration is chronically underfunded in this country, you know, horribly underfunded. Um, you know, during COVID, there was a, a discussion. So in the first COVID bill, there was $400 million that was given to uh, election administration. You know, was, uh, the Brennan Center estimated that it was $4 billion that was necessary and no further funding was forthcoming. I'm happy to say that in the uh, President Biden's budget right now, there's about $10 billion for election modernization, et cetera. So I think if we have the funding, if we utilize technologies that are available, and if we have nonpartisan election officials who are really dedicated to making sure that people have the opportunity to vote, we can implement the system. Okay. One underrated government document was the report of President Obama's commission on voting uh, back in 2014, co-chaired by Bob Bauer, loyal partisan Democratic lawyer, Ben Ginsburg, loyal partisan Republican lawyer. And they had a whole series of practical objectives. My favorite is Nobody should have to stand in line more than half an hour to vote. Um, and that would mean, as Miles said, we need adequate funding. We need an adequate number of polling places. We need machines distributed properly so that people in crowded precincts get enough machines to vote on. But I would just love the country just to take as a very simple goal, no more than a half hour in line. It's straightforward. It's also revolutionary in some places. You know, I, um, again, we only have a few minutes left. I was, when I began to read the book, my first legal instinct was, what are these guys talking about? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the First Amendment. Now, if, as Citizens United said, if speech is spending money, clearly speech is also my right to say, I don't want to vote. Now, you address it in terms of, in terms of uh, the Pledge of Allegiance, et cetera. Um, but what I found fascinating with respect to how you dealt with that question, and, uh, and, for, and for those law students on, on the, um, uh, on the uh, webinar, uh, read Spence versus Washington. Um, and you can get the site on the footnotes of the book. And here's what the book looks like, folks. So um, see if you can pick it up. Um, but talk a little bit about the none of the above option. I thought that was I thought that was uh, genius. Um, well, thank you. Um, <laughs> it, 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 Miles, why don't you take it? Uh, why don't you sure. start? I mean, one of the things that's true in Australia and certainly is true in, in the system that we would recommend, obviously, by the way, I should say that you know, it, the individual states or municipalities who adopt this will have to address all kinds of, you know, technical and, and uh, you know, kind of conforming uh, uh, policies. But the basic idea is that what we're, what we're saying people have a legal obligation to do is to participate in the system. Um, you don't have a legal obligation to vote for any of the candidates. You can spoil your ballot. Uh, 
you know, you can put uh, Professor Matto as the as a candidate on the ballot or uh, Judge Francis or Judge Francis. <laughs> right. Uh, anyway, but uh, so you can do that. But we in addition to that, out of kind of really wanting to make the point, we propose that there is a none of the above option so that people can absolutely go. And if that's the case, then the argument that libertarians make that somehow this is compelled speech, I, we think it just doesn't hold water. And just I appreciated what you said about the law. I want to shout out. We had a group of great lawyers work with us and we work with what they uh, put together for us. If I can shout them out, Allegra uh, Chapman, Cecily Hines, Brenda Wright, uh, Janine Elson, also of the uh, now of the uh, NAACP Legal Defense Fund work with us. Um, And it's very clear you can't compel speech. And we don't want to compel speech. And so we think the idea would be unconstitutional if you had to make an X next to somebody, if you had to vote for someone. But you can require behavior. And that's where none of the above comes in. That's where the blank ballot comes in. Uh, And there's a lot of case law uh, that shows that that should pass muster. Now, I will never make a prediction of how the current Supreme Court will rule on anything. Uh, but if you look at precedent, uh, I think we have a, a, pretty, a good case here that this passes constitutional muster. You know, E.J. Okay. and Judge Francis, this gives me a chance, if I can, just for one quick minute to go back to the issue of jury duty, because we, we have uh, mentioned it, but haven't really explored it. Uh, first of all, jury duty is a compelled civic duty. Uh, everybody is required to do it. We've done it for a hundred years. Nobody says, gee, we're a totalitarian country because I'm supposed to serve on juries. And the reason that we do it is because we want the jury pool for people to determine determining people's innocence or guilt and the appropriate punishment to be made up of a fully reflective um, pool of the population as a whole. We think the same argument applies in exactly the same way to voting. We want, or in, and we think everybody should want the decisions about, you know, the laws that affect everybody and the people who are going to make those laws to be made by a fully reflective, fully inclusive um, uh, part of participation. So that's why we think the jury duty. And by the way, it was a significant victory of the civil rights movement in the 60s to allow uh, black Americans to serve on juries, which really meant to allow black Americans to be compelled to serve on juries in the same way. So We think there's some real good precedent and and, uh, analogy here. Thank you for that. And, you know, guys, I I would like to further explore that with you, having um, presided over hundreds of juries and and citizens' predilections um, for or or against serving on jury duty. Um, But the time, it was not available now. (laughs) And having mentioned uh, Professor Matto, um, yes. I want to I want to turn the mic over to Professor Mano, but before I do that, um, to the to the listeners or the viewers, this book is an excellent resource to those who are already working in the election reform system and serves as an excellent bl- blueprint for 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 real action. So, gentlemen, thank you. Uh, I hope we're in touch because uh, on that jury issue and the civil rights, I I'd like to have a. A, um, a, a more informal discussion with some of my views uh, as, as and those expressed in the book. So, Professor Matto, um, I'm sorry for you went over a little bit. No, we're OK. I thank you, Judge okay. Francis. And it's been a fantastic conversation. I just want to make sure I, I get an opportunity to pose a question or two that that folks have have chat put in the Q&A or sent along when they registered and maybe combine a few, um, one by Nancy, one by Jeffrey and one by someone that Many of our viewers may know, and I know that EJ knows, uh, Professor Emeritus uh, Jerry Pomper sent along a question also. But back to the question of um, the need for bipartisan support and the challenges of of getting bipartisan support currently. Um, I would say maybe a two-part question. First of all, does a basic change in voting require um, this bipartisan support? And would you propose, you know, in your campaign, would you be open to, willing to um, e- explore some, some compromise ideas? Uh, for example, one that our, our friend Jerry Pomper suggests is a Republican uh, suggestion of a national voter ID requirement uh, that's not terribly restrictive. In an effort to get that bipartisan support, are there some sorts of compromises that you think would be feasible? 
I'm going to turn to Miles, the legislator, first. Uh, <laughs> All right. The uh, see 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 where he goes. <laughs> I, I think the answer is very much yes. Um, you know, I think when uh, legislatures and you know there have been bills filed both in Connecticut, as CJ mentioned, and in Massachusetts, and definitely some interest in Maine and several other uh, states that we have been talking to. Um, you know exactly how you would do it and how you might go about getting bipartisan support, which would obviously be the ideal. Um, you know, will be up to them. But I do think that, you know, uh, a voter ID system that is, you know, gives people options for how they can do it and doesn't cost and doesn't burden uh, any groups excessively is, I think, something that ought to be at least up for discussion. I mean, there, there, there's, uh, whatchamacallit, there's justified skepticism about it based on how ID systems have worked in the past. But I think it's a, a discussion that I would certainly be open to. Two quick things. One, in Australia, it was originally an idea that came from the conservative side of politics uh, because the conservatives were worried about the power of a rising union movement, thought the Labor Party would outorganize them. But Labor took a look at this idea and said, no, we think we could do just fine under this system. And so they've agreed on it. And there's been a little debate over the years, but no one's wanted to repeal it in the end. And Australians are very proud of the system. And one of the things I've enjoyed doing is a couple of uh, interviews with Australian media who are just very happy somebody is paying attention to the success <laughs> their system has. On Jerry Popper's point, um, I broadly agree with you, Jerry, and he is, uh, for those of you who don't know his work, uh, most people on this call probably do. What a great political scientist and a great human being. Um, the problem with voter ID laws is not the ID itself. It's the way they have been used and shaped to exclude people from the electorate. I live in the suburbs. I need a car to get around. Therefore, I need a driver's license. So it's automatic that I'm going to get an ID. For someone in the inner city who doesn't drive, who doesn't own a car, who uses mass transit, they don't need an ID. So ID requirements uh, put a particular burden on them just to simplify it. If you had a system which out front is guaranteeing that everyone will vote uh, and then created a system where everyone is provided for Election Day purposes only uh, because we don't want a national ID, but everyone is provided easily with an ID, I think the um, I think objections would fall away. And indeed, Stacey Abrams was perfectly willing to accept an ID law as long as it's broad enough that it's not exclusionary. What you can't do is what Texas did, which is say you can use your concealed carry permit, but you can't use a government issued ID to a student at a state university. Now that's rigging the system. Um, but on the ID itself, I, I think the objection is to the use and effect of the ID in negative ways, not to the idea of requiring it. We have one more minute. I'm going to ask one question just to pick up on, on one from, from one of our viewers named Jeff um, and this question of civic duty and a uh, question of whether or not, uh, you know, a universal voting requirement uh, will force disinterested voters um, to vote. Um, is that as successful? Is that a meaningful way to instill a sense of civic duty or sort of bottom line is can you, can you foster, can you force a sense of civic duty or civic obligation? Miles, go ahead. I'll, I'll close for us. There definitely time. is some some evidence in other in other countries where they do this that if you are required to vote, you do in fact as a voter go find out you know how to vote, where to vote, what the procedures are, and also who the candidates are or what the ballot questions are. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I guess I would say that I don't think that people who are not voting uh, right now are necessarily less politically educated or savvy than the people who are voting. They're just less. They may be just less ideological and less uh, uh, committed to one cause or another. So, you know, there is an argument that has been named the ignorant voter argument, which makes EJ and I both froth at the mouth a little bit. So I'll let him froth on it. <laughs> yeah, there are a couple of things about that. We really hate the ignorant voter argument. Most people who make that against our idea don't like the existing electorate either. And we show that uh, in the book and we quote V.O. Key's famous old book, the responsible electorate. And I always struggle to find the <laughs> passage in our book. Um, but um, yeah, there it is. V.O. Key wrote the perverse and unorthodox argument of this little book is that voters are not fools. And that's our 
position. And if you don't believe that, you don't believe in democracy. Um, and I, the, having a broader electorate, think of crowdsourcing. Uh, if you crowdsource bigger, you get a more you more checks on your answer, uh, which is a a, a very good thing. Um, and we also quote Kim Beasley, a longtime political leader in Australia, who talks about going to the polls from the time he was a little kid because his dad was in politics. And he said, when you talk to voters whom you know are not political junkies, who may be brought in by the civic work, you know, the requirement to vote, um, they're not as political junkie as some of the other people, but they really do pay attention and care about what they're doing. And I just want to make one point in closing. You know, we do go to Australia a lot uh, for <laughs> in our book. Um, there's something that people on this call take for granted, which is we vote through the secret ballot. Um, we didn't always vote through the secret ballot. The secret ballot was seen at the time as a radical idea. People used to come with ballots printed by their political parties or their party newspapers. Voting was in the open. Uh, who came up with the secret ballot? It used to be known as the Australian ballot. Several states in Australia had this idea. It spread through Australia. And after fierce debate, um, and you can check our footnote to Jill Lepore's wonderful piece, the historian Jill Lepore, about the spread of the secret ballot in the late 19th and early 20th century, everybody adopted the secret ballot. We wouldn't vote in any other way. What we would argue is that just as we learned from Australia 120, 130 years ago on the secret ballot, we think we can learn again with this idea. And then in 100 years from now, if we adopt this, people will say, as they say, with the secret ballot, well, isn't this the way we always did it? And uh, we hope that over time, that's where we're going to get. Well, thank you. And I would echo your, your concerns or thoughts regarding the, the argument about the ignorant voters. So certainly as director of the Center for Youth Political Participation, <laughs> young adults are often seen as apathetic um, and disengaged, um, which is certainly uh, not the case when you're looking at, at interest in, in voting. And certainly, as we saw, uh, in 2020, young adults voted in significantly high numbers. And I got to point out, New Jersey young adults were the highest voter turnout in 2020. Um, That's all so, the work of the Eagleton <laughs> Institute. Thank clearly. you. I agree. <laughs> um, sorry to say that we've run out of time, um, but I want to big, a big, big thank you to, to our guest, to Judge Francis, for a really invigorating discussion. And I would agree with Judge Francis. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an invigorating read, informative read. Um, thank you to everyone for tuning in. A reminder that the, this session was recorded, is going to be available on Eagleton's YouTube channel. A uh, reminder too, that the book is available via the links posted in the chat. And certainly a final reminder too, that ensuring the health and longevity of American democracy, democracies everywhere is a shared responsibility. Um, and universal voting may just be that tool that gets us closer to that more perfect union. So thank you very much to our authors. Thank you very much to our audience, to Judge Francis, and wishing everyone a lovely day. Thank you.